Hey folks, your OS Reviews, you're watching our retro review of the Nokia Lumia 800. This is a classic Windows phone that originally ran on Windows Phone 7.5. You can still find it here in 2016 and 2017 for sub $40, depending where you look online. And in this video, I'll also briefly discuss whether or not I still think it's a worthwhile purchase heading into this new year. So taking a quick look at the hardware and design first, in terms of specifications, we're talking about a single core Snapdragon S2 processor clocked at 1.4 gigahertz along with 512 megabytes of RAM and 16 gigabytes of built-in non-expandable storage. So in terms of specifications, these are definitely last gen. However, the thing about Windows Phone is that it's extremely optimized. Compared to something like Android, it doesn't take up at all with this relatively limited amount of RAM when operating uh, through multiple tabs, browsing games, as well as uh, going through multiple program. So it's not really a huge hindrance here, although obviously you're not going to be running the latest version of Windows Phone, which is version 10. In terms of design, it's a very beautiful phone, even though it's a lot smaller than most modern day smartphones with a 3.7 inch AMOLED display, as opposed to an average of 5 inches or 5.5 inches. In terms of uh, putting it next to a device for a sake of comparison, you can see that I have it next to a phone with a 5.5 inch screen. You can really see the size difference here. With that being said, the phone is a lot heavier than many people would expect. It feels substantial in the hand, thanks to the fact that it has a non-removable back cover that's made out of a thick layer of polycarbonate plastic, which means that even if you drop the phone, the inside will still be the same color as the outside, uh, hiding a lot of your wear and tear. Otherwise, the back houses a 8 megapixel autofocus enabled camera produced by Carl Zeiss, along with a 2 LED flash, but it isn't a two tone flash. The sides features access to classic Nokia buttons, which are chrome etched and very responsive and tactile to press. They correspond to a two stage camera shutter key for focusing and taking your image next to a power on off switch and a volume rocker. The very top features access to a 3.5mm headphone jack, so yes, this one is here. And there's also a uh, mi micro USB port for charging, takes around two hours to completely charge next to a micro sim card slot over here. This is a quad band GSM world phone, but unfortunately if you picked up the unlocked variant, it's not going to be supported with AT&T or T-Mobile's 4G LTE networks, so you will be stuck at 3G speeds at best. However, there is access to Wi-Fi in addition to Bluetooth and GPS for other wireless needs. The bottom features the single speaker, but it does get extremely loud and crisp, and overall the phone's design is colorful, it's vibrant, and what we expect from Nokia, it's solid. It feels nicely put together in the hand, it doesn't creak, it doesn't cringe, and the corners slightly round out over the edges making it feel extremely premium when you're holding it. The very top features access to the Europe piece along with the Nokia logo, and the bottom features three capacitive controls in the form of the Windows Home key, the Back key, and the Search key. The display here has been coated in a layer of Corning's Gorilla Glass, which makes it fairly resistant to scratches as well as to uh, some fingerprints, but obviously it's not going to be foul proof as you can see here. Just like the N9 that came before it, the 800 has a slight curve to the display. It's not as noticeable, but you can see the edges does curve ever so slightly, making navigation through menus and swiping left and right through multiple gestures and, and screens a lot easier and more fluid. So one of the limitations of the 800 compared to, I'd say, the N9 is that it doesn't have double tap to wake, which is a more modern feature that the N9 pioneered and we see on most modern day Android phones. Uh, but you do tap on the power key once to turn the unit on and again you're greeted to a very vibrant, colorful, and saturated display with wide viewing angles and it's fairly bright as well. Obviously the limitation here is going to be pixel density because at 800 by 480 for resolution, it's not nearly as crisp as a 720p or a 1080p display of a modern smartphone. However, it's still very responsive and again, Windows Phone here is a very optimized experience so your list and program still run very fluidly. So why might someone want to pick up a Windows phone compared to something like an Android device? Well, one of those reasons might be for security, might be for productivity. And, uh, particular, all Windows phones come equipped with uh, Microsoft Office built on in, so you have access to full versions, allowing you to both edit as well as to view Word, Excel, and PowerPoint documents on the go, which makes it quite good if you want to sync your files together, if you're giving quick presentations and you want to share them with uh, colleagues or you're at a meeting, this is a, a great productivity tool. Um, obviously, the downside of this is it doesn't have as many consumer-based apps in the sense of games and more fun entertainment-based tasks. It's going to be limited to 
to uh, compare it to something like the Google or iOS App Store. So that is still a limitation here. Because this is running on a fairly antiquated version of Windows Phone OS, uh, there is no drag down notification drawer, but you can tap on it once to kind of bring down your Wi-Fi, battery status, and time and date information, which you can find there. The tiles here, of course, as a brief refresher, are fully rearrangeable, so you can change the layout here in addition to the size, uh, along with the, kind of the color if you want to go through the theme packages through the settings. In terms of bloatware, it's very minimal, at least here in this unlocked version that you see. There's just access to settings, your phone, your, your people, which is your contacts, music setup, there is Nokia Drive, which is an interesting feature. It's uh, essentially you see this in conjunction with Nokia Maps. It gives you turn-by-turn -turn directions, and you can download pre-assigned maps uh, for a selected region, and uh, afterwards you can have offline or without Wi-Fi, without cellular data navigation, which could be quite useful just using the GPS antenna. So it's a great GPS navigator and a tool uh, if you are consistently traveling, um, so this is something to consider and keep in mind. So taking a quick look at some other things on here, there is of course music and video support by way of what was the older Zoom platform. It gives you access to a pretty decent music playing experience, uh, offers great sound quality through the speakers in addition to the headphone port on the very top. So it's still a very great media player if you're considering picking one up to replace an older iPod or something like that, despite the fact that it has 16 gigabytes of non-expandable storage. Um, otherwise, there is also access to some maps, which is uh, using more of uh, Microsoft services. There's internet Explorer, which is reasonably fast, uh, but uh, you can of course install your own browsers if you go through the App Store, which is still pretty outdated here, but you can still install a few programs there. And to launch the camera, it's pretty simple. Just tap on the camera key for a few seconds, and that opens up the 8 megapixel camera. It's actually a pretty speedy camera that takes images relatively quickly, so if I wanted to quickly focus on a subject, you can see that the uh, lens here does have a fairly good aperture, and it's a wide angle as well, so I can capture a shot very quickly, despite, again, the solar process on board. I can also go through a few settings, although not nearly as comprehensive as later, you know, pure view uh, enabled cameras produced by Nokia by form of the 808, um, you know, or 920. So you can see here I can change things like the white exposure, the ISO, the metering, the contrast, focus mode. So you can change that from macro to autofocus. And other things include flicker detection, resolution, contrast, so on and so forth. I can also turn the flash on or off. So taking a quick look at some sample shots, you can see that this is the one that I captured just now. Colors are actually very accurate. The real phone that you see in front of you does indeed have this interesting sheen to it when you see it under certain degrees of light. Um, otherwise, detail is uh, fine. It's a little bit not as uh, precise as I want. Uh, sometimes details are a little bit lost when you zoom all the way in, but not too big of a deal. So here we have another image I captured using flash, so you can see that this is what it looks like under low light environments. It's uh, fairly impressive. This is the same image when you have flash turned off. It's a bit more natural looking. Here's an outdoor shot. You can take a closer look at, I guess, of some of the finer details. And finally, more of an indoor shot without any flash. So as a camera, it still performs quite well because uh, it uses Carl Zeiss lens and that 8 megapixels is still fairly competitive for entry-level smartphones uh, even today running on Android. As a phone, uh, the, the phone quality here is actually very good. Um, it's a quad-band GSM device, which means that you can take it anywhere around the world and still make phone calls quite easily. The microphone here is noise-canceling, so even if you're placing calls under noisier environments, it's still going to pick up your voice fairly well. So good uh, audio quality here, which is good. So otherwise, battery life here will last you for about two days before you need to recharge it, depending on how much you use your phone, um, which is a bit longer than your standard Android device uh, because you know it has a smaller display, it doesn't drain as much power. Same thing with the processor, not as power hungry as some um, uh, quad-core, octa-core, deca-core processors coming out. So finally, let's take a quick look at uh, the Internet Explorer as a default browser here. So um, if we wanted to do a quick look at, I guess, the keyboard that pops up, it's a very standard Windows Phone keyboard, uh, which is to say fairly responsive and tactile. It uses Bing as a native search engine, which you can change if you want to, but that is just uh, what it's set up to do. So if we wanted to check something like New York Times, hit on the first suggestion, and you can see that pops up. As such, we're connected over Wi-Fi at the moment. It's going to load the mobile page first, but we can then toggle through the desktop mode by sliding all the way down to the bottom of the page. And the mobile page does load fairly swiftly over Wi-Fi, but the classic page should be a better benchmark of the capabilities of this browser, whether or not it's still able to perform. You can see the touchscreen here is extremely sensitive, and um, 
quite easy to navigate even smaller links. Um, there's also an easy reader mode, which you can turn on that allows you to just access more simplified versions of pages. So as you can see here, the browser here is definitely struggling a little bit with more complex pages. Images and text are not rendering completely well. Maybe it's because of the Wi-Fi. Maybe it's because of the older version of uh, Windu Windows Explorer. Maybe it's because of the limited RAM, but it's definitely not performing quite as well as you would want it to be in 2016. So that is something to keep in mind. You can then pin this as a tab, um, you know, to a home page, for instance, as a tile, if you want to launch this as a shortcut, and you can tap on the back key for a few seconds to go through all of your previously opened tabs and programs to do a bit of uh, multitasking. But uh, something with Windows Phone version 7.5 is I can't swipe them up and down to close them up completely. Uh, so if I just tap on one, it just takes me back to the to the last application, but uh, closing them completely is a bit more of a challenge and hassle. So all in all, that was a brief, I guess, view back of uh, the main software functions and performance aspects of this phone. So here comes the discussion aspect of, you know, whether or not it's really worthwhile. And in my opinion, it not necessarily uh, will be for most folks out there, because at this price point, you know, sub $40, it's pretty cheap, obviously, compared to the original asking price of around $300. But uh, if you even compare this to a lot of modern day Android smartphones, they might have already quad core processors and at least one gigabyte of RAM, which enables you to at least install more modern programs. And for most folks, that will be the better fit. So unless you're really looking for added security productivity, this won't be the best option for you. Um, it still has an outstanding build quality. It's an amazing design. The display is still bright and vibrant. Uh, but again, the web browser isn't as um, updated as you would expect just because uh, it's still running on the original kind of Windows Explorer version that was installed when this came out in 2011. Um, so you have to do a bit of twinkling, twinkling around with uh, programs as well as updating and installing and trying new software to get things more up to speed. So not as great out of the box as an experience as I would have liked. However, if you like to design here, it's really not bad. It's still a passable smartphone. It still has the basic essentials down, but uh, obviously you won't get as fast, as fluid as an experience as a more new device. So thanks for watching this video retro review of the Nokia Lumia 800 here at OS.